Let me get everything situated here. It's good to be back with you guys. I I appreciate you coming out to service on a day like today. Uh, it's been a crazy winter as far as temperatures. Uh, I think this week we saw it in the 40s and it was bracketed each side this morning I got up and, and uh, we had minus four at our house. I don't know what it was at your place, but uh, minus four is cold. Minus four is really cold. But last week it was colder. It was like minus 20. That's, that's crazy weather. Uh, we have our little dog, Oscar. I'll come down in the morning and he's like, hey, I want to go outside. I open the door and then he looks at me. And then he says, mm, I'm not going outside. And I'm like, I don't blame you. And I shut the door, you know, waiting for warmer temperatures. Um, I mean, even though I'm in the business of cold weather, uh, I mean, that's, that's what I do, you know, sell gas. If it's a warm day, I don't sell as much. A cold day, with each year, I don't mind selling not as much gas. I, I kind of like that warmer weather. You know, I was excited to see on the way in, it was up to 20 degrees, you know. I'm like, oh, this is nice. Uh, it's strange how our bodies adjust to temperature. Uh, earlier in the winter, when it was 20, 30 degrees, I was bundled up. After being out in minus 20, which, I mean, honestly, everything just hurts at minus 20. I mean, breathing hurts at minus 20. Last week, I was going around, I was working, and it was 20 degrees. I'm like, oh, I barely need a jacket. You know, it's just, it's kind of crazy how things go. But I do appreciate you. I mean, it is a challenge to come out on days like this. I mean, having a nice cup of coffee or a cup of tea, depending if you're English or not, uh, depending if you're a Hetrick or I would say a Gourley, but my grandpa always said he was too young to have coffee. Uh, but my mom is a tea drinker. Uh, I kind of, I appreciate a cup of tea. That's, I grew up with my mom having a cup of tea. Uh, sometimes it just, that cup of tea hung out in the microwave all day because she would forget to grab it, but there was a cup of tea somewhere in the house. But, you know, in days like this, uh, it, it takes a little motivation to come out, and I appreciate you guys uh, facing the elements to come out to service today. Um, the scripture up there, Luke one thirty seven, says, Faith, it does not make things easy. It makes things possible. Uh, I don't know if you remember or not, but we've been talking about faith. That's kind of the, the topic, the subject that we've been, been reviewing over the past year during my time with you. And I'm kind of excited that I'm here next Sunday because I get to do a two-parter. I mean, normally it's just like a one and done, but this is a two-parter uh, message. Um, and again, we're going to be talking about faith. And again, we can't get away from boats. Uh, we've just been stuck with boats. Uh, so the scripture for today is from Acts 27. And this is a, this is a crazy scripture. I mean, it's just, I can't imagine these guys. The heading on the chapter says, Paul sails for Rome. It's a little misleading or it's a little understated because Paul doesn't really have a choice in going to Rome. Paul is a prisoner. He's in chains. We often find Paul at some point in his ministry in chains. It's kind of like a familiar subject. But Paul, he's in chains said he's decided we will sail for Italy. Paul and some prisoners were handed over to a centurion named Julius who belonged to the Imperial Regiment. We boarded a ship from, yes, about to sail for ports along the coast of the province of Asia. And we put out to sea. Erastachris, a Macedonian from Thessalonica, was with us. And he goes down through here and he talks about 
uh, this journey that they're on and as they kind of go from port to port to port and they get to this place and they hadn't been making good progress in verse 9 it says much time had been lost sailing had already become dangerous because it was now after the fast so there was a time of the year they were past it uh, it wasn't a good time to be out on the water Paul warned the men I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to ship and cargo and to our lives also but the centurion Instead of listening to what Paul said, well, of course not. I mean, Paul's the prisoner, the centurion, he's the boss. He followed the advice of the pilot and the owner of the ship who were saying, hey, let's press forward. We got places to go. We got, I want to say things to see, but we got places to go. We got things to deliver. Time is money. Since the harbor was unsuitable to winter in, the majority decided to sell on, hoping to reach Phoenix and winter there. This was a harbor in Crete, facing both southwest and northwest. Verse 13 picks up. The heading on this is the storm. A gentle wind began to blow, and they thought they had obtained what they wanted. So they weighed anchor, sailed along the shore of Crete, but before very long, a wind of hurricane force called the Northeaster, swept down from the island. Ship was caught in a storm and could not head into the wind, so they gave way and were driven along. As we passed to the lee of a small island called Kauda, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure. When the men had hoisted it together, I mean hoisted it aboard, they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together. So at this point, the storm is so bad that they're using ropes and they're going underneath to provide support. I mean, things are serious. They're, they can't get their nose into the wind, so they turn around and they're just going where the storm's taking them. Wherever the storm's blowing, that's where this ship is heading. And uh, they pull the lifeboat aboard and they put a ropes underneath to keep it from breaking apart. When the men hoisted aboard, the ropes were passed underneath. Uh, fearing that they had run aground of sandbars of Sirtis, they lowered the sea anchor and, and let the ship be driven along. So they're, they're not just being blown along at this point. They drop an anchor and they're, they're slowly being pulled along. They know kind of where they are. They know there's some sandbars and they could be a shipwreck on them. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw cargo overboard. Things are going from bad to worse. Uh, the ship, they have ropes underneath to hold it secure. The storm is not letting up and they're saying, hey, we need to lighten things up. Anything that basically isn't, belt, isn't nailed down is getting tossed overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. Neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and the storm continued raging. We finally gave up all hope of being saved. Man, these were, sea, these were seafaring people. These were sailors. They knew the weather. They knew the conditions, and they were in a bad state. They have done all they can do. The storm had pounded them for days. They didn't know how long. It was, you know, they were caught up in this hurricane. They couldn't even see the sun or the stars. Night or day, it's just storm. Verse 20. We finally gave up all hope. Even though they were men of experience, they got to a place of despair. After the men had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up and said, Men, you should have taken my advice. Paul, this isn't really... I mean, sometimes you read stuff in Scripture and you wonder why it's there. And this statement from Paul, like, Paul, did you really have to say that? Did you really have to kick him when they were down? 
I don't know why he did. I don't have an answer for it, but it's recorded. He said, look, you should have taken my advice not to sell from Crete. You would have spared yourself the damage and loss. But now, I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. God has graciously given you the lives of all the men you sail with. So keep up courage, men, for I have faith in God. That it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we will run aground on some island. The storm, as we read on, the storm goes on for two weeks. This is a long time. It's a long time to be in a storm that's so bad that you have basically thrown everything overboard. That you are just kind of being controlled by an anchor dragging along the ocean bottom. That you have no hope of making any type of direction. That you have tossed it all overboard. That even the leaders on the ship are saying, we have lost all hope of being saved. Paul at this point, Paul's a man of faith. Paul has been in some bad situations. I mean, this is a guy who's been stoned, left for dead. Um, if you look in Corinthians... It talks about he's been in shipwrecks. I don't know if this was his first one or if it was his last one. He's familiar with it. But Paul, what Paul does know is God. Paul has faith. Faith does not make things easy. It makes things possible. It would be really cool if we're in the middle of that storm, if it's like that Jesus moment where he speaks to the storm and everything goes quiet. But sometimes we're like Paul and we're on the boat and the storm's happening and everything's going crazy and everybody around us, even those that are supposed to know better, have lost hope. And at that point, perhaps we're the ones called to be the Paul in other people's lives. See, we have a measure of faith that is given to us each day. And uh, God knows the troubles that are going to happen that day. As a believer, we can stand on that faith. We can stand on that promise that we will never be left and that we will never be forsaken. That we can be like a Paul and say, people, I got a place to go and there's something ahead of me and God has spoken and we're going to make it. If we listen to me back then, I'm not saying to kick people when they're down, but Paul did a little bit here, but you know, we can share that faith and say, Hey, God's got this. It's not over yet. I've been thinking about this scripture since the invite came for church. I've known about what I was to share. And as I was thinking about it, I came across a story and I want to read it to you because it's a great story about someone who kept it together when everything went wrong. This is the story of U.S. Airways Flight 1549. It took place on January 15th, 2009. You may know it. As a, if you don't know it, as I get into it, it's going to come back. Because this is a story that is unforgettable. <laughs> It deals with a flight, an airplane, Airbus A320 was the plane. And it was leaving <coughs> New York's LaGuardia Airport bound for Charlotte, North Carolina.
The story goes that the flight was cleared for takeoff from LaGuardia's runway number four at 3.24 p.m. At 3.25, it became airborne. So roughly a minute later, two minutes later, it becomes airborne. It was at 700 feet and it was climbing, so it had left the air, the runway, and it was starting its ascent. Uh, for those who have been uh, on an airplane, that's the, this is the point where you're leaning back in the chair and you can feel it in your chest and it's pushing you back. And this is the opportunity if you get air sick, this is maybe when air sickness might set in. At 326, 37, so roughly 45 seconds, the captain looks to his co-pilot and says, oh, what a view at the Hudson River today. 40 seconds later at 327, the plane struck a flock of Canadian geese at an altitude of 2,800 feet at about four and a half miles from the airport. When the airplane hit this flock of Canadian geese, this airplane which has two engines, both engines were taken out. The pilot's view was filled with large birds. Passengers and crew said they heard a very loud bang and saw flames from the engines, followed by silence and an odor of fuel. Can you imagine? You know, think about those sailors and the chaos that they were in when the storm came in. Now think of the passengers, which were, were about 150 passengers on this plane. Some had aisle seats, some had window seats. You're roughly a half mile off the ground. You're kind of maybe looking over your shoulder a little bit and you hear a thud. This is not the thud of the landing gear being retracted. And you look out, doesn't matter if you're on the left or the right, and you see both engines now on fire. Oh my goodness, can you imagine? Can you imagine for a second being a passenger on that plane? You're just a couple minutes from takeoff and suddenly it's, I mean, in a plane you can hear the engines and then there was silence. And there's a smell of fuel, really? I mean, we have watched way too many disaster movies in our time. Your imagination, if you weren't already starting to panic at what is going on, you're like, you're probably trying to make sense of what is happening, what am I not hearing, what, what did we just hit? Your imagination is probably starting to play. I imagine for the passengers, there was an initial shock followed by a bit of chaos. At 328, the plane which was ascending is now descending without its engines. The captain radios to the New York terminal. This is Cactus 1599, the call sign. We have hit birds. We have lost both engines. We're turning back to LaGuardia. Air traffic controller Patrick Harden told the tower that uh, he directed all traffic away and directed them towards runway 31. This is happening fast. It's happening in real time. This is the what you never want to have happen is happening. The captain responds, unable. He then asked for permission to land in New Jersey, mentioning the Tetoboro Airport. Permission was probably immediately granted. The captain responds, yes, 
But then he says, we can't do it. The captain is aware of the situation. He knows how the plane is responding and not responding. He knows he has no power. He is now in a glide. He responds, we're going to go in the Hudson. The captain makes the call to the cabin. Brace for impact. The flight attendants relayed the command to the message to the passengers. Meanwhile, air traffic controllers asked the Coast Guard to caution vessel, vessels in the Hudson and asked them to prepare for assistance. The captain sees what's happening. And this is within minutes of takeoff. I mean, for 150 people, this is just a routine day. This is just part of their every day. And suddenly, chaos is happening. 90 seconds later, the plane makes an unpowered ditching, descending southwards at 125 knots, which is roughly 140 miles per hour, into the middle of the North River, River of the Hudson. Flight attendants compared the ditching to a hard landing with one impact, no bounce, then a gradual deceleration. The ebb tide then began to take the plane southward. If, there, if we read about stuff and we, we think about stuff being understated for that, uh, for that description, oh, it was, like a, it was like a hard bounce. You know, I, I can't imagine. Then a gradual deceleration. So while, while the plane has both engines gone and they can't make it that, back to the airport, this pilot is able to do a water landing with such skill that the flight attendant describes it as a hard bounce followed by a slight deceleration. The captain orders the cockpit door to open and gives the order to evacuate. They evacuate into air temperatures that were 19 degrees with a water temperature of 41 degrees. So as if the, the bird strike was not bad enough, as if it wasn't bad enough that they lost both motors, that they had to make a water landing. They're now in water that has a temperature of 41 degrees with air temperature at 19 degrees. Getting into that type of water, hypothermia sets in almost instantly. So as if you, you survive the wreck, now you've got to deal with the water. The captain was able to pilot the airplane into such a place where there were boats in the vicinity who immediately came to rescue. Talks about the 150 passengers, everyone on the plane survived, everyone. Captain makes two final sweeps of the plane, it's all clear. He steps off. The time is 3.55 p.m. Oh my goodness. Can you imagine that? So half hour. The craziness of this half hour. The captain made a statement that he had a lifetime of small investments into the experience of piloting an airplane. A lifetime. Small deposits. He said, I just happened to make a very big withdrawal on this day. This captain, as we look at him, his name's Captain Chelsea Sullenberger. And we look at, they call us the miracle on the Hudson. And it truly is. This captain did something that was amazing. It was amazing what he was able to do. His poise under the chaos. 
He didn't anticipate that to happen when he'd taken off. But when we look at the captain's life, when we look at his co-pilot, his co-pilot had over 10,000 hours in an airplane. But the captain at this point had over 40 years experience as a pilot. He had over 4,000 hours piloting this plane, this, this type of airplane, over 4,000 hours. He had over 10,000 hours as a commercial pilot. At this point, he had been a commercial pilot since roughly 1980 up until this point, so roughly 39 years of experience. But there's something else about this this captain, Captain Sullenberger. The man that was the right man at the right time. He was also a retired pilot from the Air Force. I mean, this guy went to the Air Force Academy in Colorado and had a, a career as a pilot for the Air Force before he became a, a commercial pilot. He had a lifetime of experience and preparation. I mean, he had never had a water landing before. Not many people do. But when the chaos happened, he was prepared and he was ready for it. He had small deposits over a lifetime of experience that allowed him to take one big withdrawal when the time was right. When we look at this, and when we look at the scripture, Paul had a lifetime of faith that was building. He had a lot of experiences. So that when we get to this point that is closer to the end of Paul's life, when he's in that shipwreck, he's able to tell everybody, from a place of faith because he knew. He knew as God. Be courageous. Not one of you will be lost. Everybody else had given up hope. It's probably fair to say everybody outside of the cockpit of flight 1549 had probably given up hope. Probably thoughts, if not screams, we're going to die. Honestly, those are very realistic. That fear is very realistic. But there was somebody in the cockpit who was trained, prepared, who had worked their entire life for that moment. Guys, I encourage you. Some of you are further down this journey than I am. But you have an entire lifetime of experience. Uh, some of it may be with parenting. Some of it may be with marriage. Some of it may just be with life. Some of it's with matters of faith. That when there is that moment, you have a big account to make a withdrawal from. That when everybody's around saying, we have given up hope of being saved. You can say, men, you, uh, I might encourage you not to say, men, you should have taken my advice, but that I urge you to keep up courage because not one of you will be lost. Guys, we live in a time, and we've talked about this before, it's unprecedented for our generation, this pandemic. And honestly, there's still people who are very fearful and they're very scared and it's very real. But God's got this. And we have an opportunity now to be a Captain Sullenberger for other people. We have the opportunity to be a Paul for other people. And uh, that's my encouragement to you today. You know, just... Just to think on that story, to think of Paul. Um, the story's not over for Paul, which is why I'm coming back next week. So uh, can we just close with a hymn, number 410.